Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to introduce our guests this evening. Carmen Maria Machado's best-selling debut short story collection, Her Body and Other Parties, was listed as a member of the New Vanguard in the New York Times, one of 15 remarkable books by women that are shaping the way we read and write fiction in the 21st century. A New York Times review highlighted her creation of a glittering genre all her own, one that looks hard at what we fear and what we desire, and then mischievously scrambles everything together. There is abundant, utterly hypnotic invention in these stories, but it's the psychological realism at their core, their depictions of the everyday violence visited upon women that gives them their otherworldly power. The book was a National Book Award finalist, among many other honors, and a television show based on the book is currently in development at FX. Her new book, In the Dream House, is an absorbing and inventive account of a relationship gone bad, and a bold dissection of the mechanisms and cultural representations of psychological abuse. The book explodes our ideas about what a memoir can do and be. She'll be joined in conversation this evening with Emma Eisenberg, author of the forthcoming book, The Third Rainbow Girl, The Long Life of a Double Murder in Appalachia. Please welcome Carmen Maria Machado and Emma Eisenberg to the Free Library. Hello, Philadelphia. How are you? Um, I am really excited to be here in my favorite place. Um, where I live, <laughs> to read for you from um, In the Dream House. I have never read, this is my first thing where like the book is a full thing as opposed to like a short story collection. So I think the only things you need to know about the pieces I'm gonna read from the book, and I'm gonna read for about 10 to 15 minutes, so not very long. Um, the only things you need to know is that this is a experimental memoir about a abusive relationship I had with an ex-girlfriend. I refer to her as the woman in the dream house, so if you hear me say that, that's who I'm referring to. Um, uh, I, think, I think that's it. Um, oh, some of it's in second person, so the you is just, you know, me. And when I start reading, I've already met her. So I think that's, yeah, I think that's all you need to know. Okay. Dream house as luck of the draw. Part of the problem was, as a weird fat girl, you felt lucky. She did what you'd wished a million others had done, looked past arbitrary markers of social currency and seen your brain and ferocious talent and quick wit and pugnacious approach to assholes. When you first started writing about fatness a long time ago in your live journal, who here was on live journal? I miss it every day. A commenter said to you that you were pretty and smart and charming, but as long as you were Zoftig, you'd never have your choice of lovers. You remember feeling outrage and then processing the reality, the practicality of what he'd said. You were so angry at the world. You wondered when she came along if this was what most people got to experience in their lives, a straight line from want to satisfaction, desire manifested and satisfied in reasonable succession. This had never been the case before. It had always been fraught. How many times had you said, if I just looked a little different, I'd be drowning in love. Now you got to drown without needing to change a single cell. Lucky you. Dreamhouse as Bluebeard. Bluebeard's greatest lie was that there was only one rule. The newest wife could do anything she wanted, anything, as long as she didn't do that tiny but single inconsequential thing, didn't stick that, didn't stick that tiny inconsequential key into that tiny inconsequential lock. But we all know that was just the beginning, a test. She failed and lived to tell the tale as I have. But even if she'd passed, even if she'd listened, there would have been some other request, a little larger, a little stranger, and if she'd kept going, kept allowing herself to be trained like a corset fanatic, pinching her waist smaller and smaller, 
There would have been a scene where Bluebeard danced around with the rotting corpses of his past wives, clasped in his arms, and the newest wife would have sat there mutely, suppressing growing horror, swallowing the egg of vomit that bobbed behind her breastbone. And then later, another scene in which he did unspeakable things to the bodies, women, they'd once been women, and she just stared dead into the middle distance, seeking some mute purgatory where she could live forever. Some scholars believe that Bluebeard's Bluebeard is a symbol of his supernatural nature, easier to accept than being brought to heel by a simple man. But isn't that the joke? He can be simple, and he doesn't have to be a man. Because she hadn't blinked at the key and its conditions, hadn't paused when he told her her footfalls were too heavy for his liking, hadn't protested when he fucked her while she wept, hadn't declined when he suggested that she stop speaking, hadn't said a word when he left bruises on her arms, hadn't scolded him for speaking to her like she was a dog or a child, hadn't run screaming down the path from the castle into the nearest village pleading with someone to help, help, help. It made logical sense that she sat there and watched him spinning around the body of wife number four, the decaying back head flopping backward on a hinge of flesh. This is how you are toughened, the newest wife reasoned. This is where the tenacity of love is practiced, its tensile strength, its durability. You are being tested and you are passing the test. Sweet girl, sweet self, look how good you are, look how loyal, look how loved. Dreamhouse as appetite. You make a mistake early on, though you don't know it at the time. You admit to her that you are constantly nursing low-grade crushes on many people in your life. Nothing acted on, just that you find many people attractive and do your best to surround yourself with smart and funny minds, and the result is a gooey, lovely space somewhere between Philia and Eros. You've been this way as long as you can remember. You've always found this quirk of your personality to be just that, a quirk, and she laughs and says she's charmed by it. Over the course of your relationship, she will accuse you of fucking or wanting to fuck or planning to fuck the following people, your roommate, your roommate's girlfriend, dozens of your friends, the clarion class you haven't even met yet, a dozen of her friends, not a few of her colleagues at Indiana, her ex-girlfriend, her ex-boyfriend, your ex-boyfriends, several of your teachers, the director of your MFA program, um, and then possibly the most demented moment of the exercise, her father. Also an untold litany of strangers, people on the subway and in coffee shops, waiters at restaurants, store clerks and grocery store cashiers, and librarians and ticket takers and janitors and museum goers and beach sleepers. The problem is that denial sounds like confession to her, so the burden of proof is forced upon you. To show that you have not been fucking those people, you become adept at doing searches on your phone, providing evidence you haven't been in contact with anyone. You stop talking about a promising student in one of your classes because she becomes fixated on the idea that you have a crush on a 19-year-old who has just learned how to balance exposition and scene. One day, as she rubs her fingers over you and you close your eyes in pleasure, she grabs your face and twists it toward her. She gets so close to you, you smell something sour on her breath. Who are you thinking about, she says. It's phrased like a question, but it isn't. Your mouth moves, but nothing comes out, and she squeezes your jaw a little harder. Look at me when I fuck you, she says. You pretend to come. Dream House as Mystical Pregnancy. Um, this has a footnote in it, and I'll tell you where the footnote starts. Every television show you watched in your 20s included some kind of mystical pregnancy. Every interesting female character needs one, or so showrunners seem to think. Vampires get pregnant with magical mortals. Comatose women give birth to gods and empathic Starfleet officers to mystic energy. Time-traveling companions discover they've been flesh avatars for months, and their actual body is somewhere far away and about to give birth. One woman wakes up on her wedding day to discover herself massively pregnant, courtesy of an alien. You are thinking of these episodes when you begin to experience pregnancy symptoms in the dream house. You vomit into the toilet, you feel swollen and out of sorts. The two of you have talked about a child for so long, a little girl, Clementine. 
that you abandon all reason and wonder if you could be pregnant. You've had so much sex and, and the intensity between the two of you feels real as anything. You consider saying to her, ha, huh, I'm sick like I'm pregnant, isn't that weird? But you are terrified of the radical body modification that is pregnancy, of the dangers of childbirth, the unforgiving nature of motherhood, and most importantly, what she'll accuse you of, what you'll do afterward. You drink ginger ale, you lie down for a long time, you forego food for an evening under the pretense of having snacked, which you absolutely did not. You cannot be pregnant, you cannot be pregnant, you literally absolutely could not be pregnant under any circumstances. And here's the footnote. Thompson, motif index of folk literature. Type 511, 1.3, conception from eating mango. T511, 1.5, conception from eating lemon. T511, 2.1, conception from eating mandrake. T511, 2.2, conception from eating watercress. T511, 3.1, conception from eating peppercorn. T511, 3.2, conception from eating spinach. T511, 4.1, conception from eating rose. T511, 5.2, conception from swallowing worm in a drink of water. T511, 5.3, conception from eating loud. T511 6.1, conception from eating a woman's heart. T511 6.2, conception from eating finger bones. T511 7.1, conception after eating honey given by a lover. T511 8.6, conception from swallowing a pearl. T512.4, conception from drinking a saint's tears. T512.7, conception from drinking dew. T513.1, conception through another's wish. T514, T514, conception after reciprocal desire for each other. T515.1, impregnation through a lustful glance. T516, conception through a dream. T517, conception from extraordinary intercourse. T521, conception from sunlight. T521.1, conception from moonlight. T521.2, conception from a rainbow. T522, 522. Uh, I've already lost my place. Conception from falling rain. T523, conception from bathing. T524, conception from wind. T525, conception from a falling star. T525.2, impregnation by comet. T528, impregnation by thunder and lightning. T532, 1.3, impregnation by a leaf of lettuce. T532, 1.4, conception by the smell of a cooked dragon's heart. T532, 1.4.1, conception after smelling ground bone dust. T532.2, conception from stepping on an animal. T523.3, conception from fruit thrown against the breast. T532.5, conception from putting on another's girdle. T532.10, conception from the hiss of a cobra. T533, conception from spittle. T5 conception from blood, T535, conception from fire, T536, conception from a feathers falling on a woman, T539.2, conception by a cry. You take a pregnancy test anyway, like an idiot, and of course it's negative because you haven't had a penis anywhere near your body in years. You're afraid, you're afraid she'll find the test, so you put it in a Ziploc bag and throw it out in someone's trash can on the street after she's gone to class. This is the last one. Dream house as natural disaster. I get bad heartburn. It's the Zoloff which takes the edge off my anxiety but brings along a bunch of awful side effects like a good friend who can't shed a bad lover. Every so often I take my nightly meds and within a few minutes feel like a hot poker has been shoved down my esophagus. I chew antacids and walk to the bathroom. Often the pain or the force of the neutralization makes me vomit. I become functionally everyone's favorite science fair project. When I bend over the toilet, I think a lot about how my heart is like a volcano, like that quote from Khalil Gibran. It's dumb, but it moved me, and I wrote it down on a post-it note that I stuck to my desk. If your heart is a volcano, how shall you expect flowers to bloom in your hands? It stayed there until a bad day, working on this book, when I suddenly loathed the quote with every fiber of my being and crumpled it up and threw it away. Reader. Do you remember that ridiculous movie Volcano, the one with Tommy Lee Jones? Do you guys remember that movie? Do you remember how they stopped the eruption in the middle of downtown Los Angeles? They diverted it with cement roadblocks and pointed fire hoses at it, and then rerouted the lava to the ocean, and then everything was fine? <laughs> Sweet reader, that is not how lava works. Anyone can tell you that. Here is the truth. I keep waiting for my anger to go dormant, but it won't. I keep waiting for someone to reroute my anger into the ocean, but no one can. My heart is closer to Dante's peak of Dante's peak. My anger dissolves grandmas in acid lakes and raises quaint Pacific Northwest towns with ash and asphyxiates jet engines with its grit. 
Lava keeps leaking down my slopes. You should have listened to the scientist. You should have evacuated earlier. So Khalil Gibran, I know what he's saying, but even rhetorically, he's making exactly the wrong point. The fact is, people settle near volcanoes because the resulting soil is extraordinary, dense with nutrients from the ash. In this dangerous place, their fruit is sweeter, their crops taller, their flowers more radiant, their yield more bountiful. The truth is, there's no better place to live than in the shadow of a beautiful, furious mountain. Thank you. Thanks for that reading, friend. Um, yeah, I just feel like it's been such a wonderful um, experience to watch this book come into the world, and I'm just very, like, just like so proud and happy to be here with you in this week of its birth. We get one more round of applause for In the Dream House birthday. Yes, very exciting. So it's a really tough, it's a tough book and I think we should take the joy where we could get it. So um, I feel like it's really necessary to start in talking about this book with um, its form and the many forms that it takes and wants to take and ends up taking by the end. So I wondered just how did you come to these many forms? Did some of them come first? Um, was the idea always to have this multitude of forms or did that come later? So when I first started trying to write the material in this book, I was just trying to, I mean, write like a sort of straightforward narrative about it and I, I struggled and it was not good. I would, I'd write it and then I'd read it and I'd be like, this is terrible and I would throw it away or get rid of it or file it away. <laughs> And it was just this thing which I now recognize because I feel like now I'm, I'm older and wiser. Um, sometimes you're just not the right writer to write something at that moment. And I was not in a place in any way, either creatively, sort of prose-wise, talent-wise, or also like sort of just headspace-wise. Mm. I wasn't like in the right place to, to get that written. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, and so at some point I was actually in Iowa City, where I, didn't, I no longer lived there, because I mean, the book, part of the book is set in Iowa City, but I had actually moved to Philly, but I went back for the summer where I was teaching um, sweet little high schoolers. They were like at writing nerd camp, mm -hmm. which I never got to do, so I was like, I want to be a counselor there. So <laughs> I, was, I taught a class, and, um, and I had a lot of free time, and I was like, talking to the students a lot about genre, and so I was just like talking about it every single day, and I like was out walking, and at some point I sort of began thinking about haunted houses, which is like a, an obsession I've had for years now. Um, and I was thinking a lot about haunted houses and the idea of a haunting and what a haunting was and the gothic and I was just sort of having these like various thoughts and then suddenly I was like, oh, you know, I could write about that thing as like a haunted, like thinking about hauntings and the gothic as like mm -hmm. sort of an organizing principle. And so then I, and then I was like, yeah, but like it's, I, what about this thing and this thing that that wouldn't really fit? And then I was like, what if I tried a bunch of different genres? By the time I had left Iowa City a few weeks later, I had a notebook that was just full of ideas. And it was, mm -hmm. I mean, it was literally just like lists of like tropes and narrative arcs and like mm -hmm. just everything you can possibly imagine, way more than are actually in the finished book, like hundreds and hundreds. In the fi final book, there's 144, I think, um, like modes that each chapter is in. But yeah, I had lots more. Um, yeah, and then, and then you could tell it was right because it was like, it's cracked, everything cracked open and like immediately the whole book like fell out of me. Like, <laughs> it was real gross. It was just like, <laughs> um, and, and it was, and I was like, ah, I see. So that, I was like, apparently that's what I was seeking was like a form, like a shape that made sense to me and, and mm -hmm. that's what it was. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think the sh that sense of shape is really apparent and that's really useful to know. I think also like from the very beginning, you know, there's a, there's a sort of, pre-page that says like I never read prologues and then you turn the page and it's a prologue so I felt like there was always this kind of like multiplicitous and both and logic that mm -hmm. propelled the book which mm -hmm. seems to me a bit different from other books um, that are like simply written in fragments like yeah. something like a Mary Robeson or um, like Jenny Offel's Department of Speculation so I kind of wondered like was the fragment or just like the choice to have short elements or short mm -hmm. pieces mm -hmm. many of them um, how did that come into play? Or do you see your book in conversation with other books in fragments? Um, is it a real jerk thing to say? I see it in conversation with like one of my own stories. So it feels like a really <laughs> horrible thing to say for some reason, but I actually feel like the story for my first book, especially Heinous, which is a, um, if you haven't read it, it's like a piece of Law and Order SVU fan fiction. That's how we and, met. Yeah. And, and it is also in these tiny pieces. And I remember when I was writing it, like the idea that I had to use these like tiny, almost like micro fictions to create like a larger experience. Mm -hmm. And when I took it into workshop, I was lucky enough to be, I, Kevin Brockmeyer was teaching me that semester. And if you guys don't know him, you must. He's like an absolute genius and like 
a gentle, wonderful man who really encouraged this book. But back then, he was like looking at especially heinous, and he was like talking to me about like how to kind of continue because at that point only it was only like half written, and he was like talking about symphonic structures, so like work that you know, like, like the effect of the work is like sort of through this like accrual of like mood, you know, as mm -hmm. opposed to just like a sort of more straightforward narrative. And the way that I've always sort of described it to students and the way that I think about it is also like the only math I can remember, which is like a scatter plot graph, <laughs> right? Where there's like lots of points of data and then there's like a best fit line that moves through it and like you're getting all these different pieces and then like the, the general aboutness of the piece is like the best fit line that's moving through the story. Mm -hmm. So like in Especially Heinous, I would have like, you know, little bits of various plot lines and also there would be like these sort of free form, like these single one-off episodes or like these little, a couple of them was like, like little two episode arcs or whatever. And, and then the effect of the story was like a certain kind of way of, be, of reading. And so I feel like for this book, it was sort of the same um, where I was imagining like each piece sort of like taking something that's like really hard to look at and like turning it over and over and over and over and like recording it like a scientist would and then like mm -hmm. hoping that the accrual of the mood, like the mood that would accrue from that would say something to me mm. and to other people. And I think, I think that's what it did. I mean, and I mean, like I said, like I think that's why the form was so correct. And I think that's why my brain, my brain needed it because I think my brain had not like figured out, not even in terms of like trauma or like recovery or whatever, but just my brain hadn't figured out some stuff. Like it was sort of like, I'm still trying to like intellectually understand like what happened. And, and yeah, and I think that that, that effect is just like part of it. So I feel like that's, sort of what I'm going forward thinking about fragmentation mm -hmm. and like the little pieces. For sure. I mean, especially heinous is dear to me. That's how I came to your work. <laughs> yes. And just like the idea of the the longness and the almost like extraness of it being part of the point of yeah. it. I actually yeah. had an editor, the editor who published that story suggested cutting it because he was like, it's just so long. Cause it was like 17,000 words long or something. Very, very long. And I was like, yeah, but the form demands, like it, it, I have to include every episode in these first 12 seasons. And if I don't, the form is broken. <laughs> and he was like, okay. Like, he was just like, sure, fine. Um, so, so yeah, so I feel like there was, there was something about, like I actually am kind of a stickler for that. Like I'm like, I, I must mm -hmm. like, I'm, I'm into the rigor I'm just into the rigor of the form. <laughs> I totally. want it to be in charge, so, yeah. You can sense the rigor, I feel, <laughs> for sure, which I truly appreciate. I also think this idea of mood is really important, and there's a slipperiness between mood and voice, but mm -hmm. maybe something, probably the thing I would say I admire most about this book is the way that it feels like it's all in one voice, even though it's in many yeah. modes, and I wondered if you could speak a little bit to, like, the construction of the second person voice and the first person voice mm -hmm. and sometimes it's in third. So like, how did you think of like one unifying sort of like mood or voice for yeah. this project? Yeah, well when I submitted the draft that I sold to Grey Wolf to my editor, it was only the memoir bit. So I knew I wanted all the research material, mm -hmm. but I just hadn't done it yet. <laughs> and I was like, can will you buy this part and then I'll do the <laughs> other parts later. And they were like, sure. <laughs> so I sold them the book and I had written it in second person kind of by accident. Like as I was writing the pieces, they were coming out in second person. And I was mm -hmm. like, huh, I'm gonna probably have to analyze that later. Um, <laughs> and my editor sort of said the same thing. He was like, he was like, it's not that you can't do it. It's just that I want to make sure that you're being purposeful and intentional about the use of second person. And I was like, cool. But like, I sold it right before her body came out, so I like didn't look at the book for like a year after I sold it. So when I finally returned to it, I was like, oh, I'll just put it in first person, whatever. And then as I was doing it, the text was like resisting me. Like mm -hmm. a lot of the pieces I was trying to put into first sounded really weird to my ear. Like they weren't fitting. Um, and. Yeah, and so I just, and so then I left that in second, but then like also I couldn't do like the essay parts in second, like that would have been really weird. And I was doing all this research and this history, and I was just like, yeah, like I feel like that would be really weird in second. So what I ended up, the, the book that actually was a model for me for this particular question was We the Animals by Justin Torres, which if you if y'all haven't read it, you absolutely must. It's like a gorgeous, gorgeous novel. Um, and it's told in this um, first person plural voice, like a we voice, these brothers. And then later in the book, there's a an act of trauma and it like shatters the point of view. And then you get like some in second, some in third, some in first. And like, it's this really like, where like the, the trauma is like felt down to the marrow of the prose. Like the very perspective is like broken into pieces. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. So what I end up doing in the book is I like sort of in the very beginning gesture, this like breaking where it's like, the I is like the me that is sitting in front of you right now and the you is like this past version of myself that's like trapped in this eternal present tense and is just like living out this like thing over and over. Mm -hmm. And like this book was about me like stepping up to her and like trying to like 
understand her, but not actually willing to like reach her or access her in any way um, because the past is fixed. Mm -hmm. Which I also write about like Nabokov's self-consistency principle, which is like a principle of time travel that talks about the past being fixed, that like even if we could travel through time, you wouldn't be able to like unmake what had already happened because like physics would not allow you to. And I feel like the yeah, so the, the, the second person became like almost like manifestation of that idea where it's like you can access this like other past self, but you can't you can't tell her anything, you can't change mm -hmm. anything that actually happened. Mm -hmm. So And I think that really works because you've sort of stitched the research into the present by using mm -hmm. the first person in all of the in like both the contemporary like Carmen the like you know, fictionalized character of the writer in the present and then also the research parts. Yeah. And I feel like there was a real energy around like the compulsion to read and research and look. Um, and I'm also just like very here for the fairy tale um, trope, like encyclopedia, oh, yeah. which I too have scoured on many an occasion. So mm -hmm. like, yeah, you have, how did the like, <laughs> um, the classification, the, the impetus to like classify and taxonomize mm -hmm. and get to that, um, all the ones that appear in the footnotes that you read, like so beautifully, the motif index of folk literature, like how did that yeah. come to you? Um, and why is it there? I, I mean, I, I, I was doing a lot of stuff about fairy tales, like in this book, like there's a bunch of different fairy tales. I mean, I've read Bluebeard as well. There's just like a bunch of different sections that are like that. And so I really wanted to um, fuss with that. And at some point I was just like online and like a fugue state, like just flipping through the <laughs> internet, looking at fairy tale stuff and like just these indexes. And there are like a bunch of them. Like I actually used two in this book and there's like a ton of like different, you know, scholars who have like used their own system to like, you know, categorize folk tales or whatever. Mm. Um, but that one, the Stith Thompson one was like, I found a PDF of it. And it was like a thousand pages long <laughs> and it had like every possible thing you could think of. And when you read it out loud, it was like a prose poem. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. And so I, um, and so I began to like, as I was as I was writing, I would like have that like PDF and I'd be like searching the PDF and I would be looking for like interesting ones that sort of seem to fit with like various or I would, sometimes I would just scan it, you know, just like see things, if things would catch my eye. Um, like there was actually one, I'm trying to remember what page it was, that was like, that like, I just found it because I was like just scanning through it one day. Like I was just like hanging out and it was like um, about the liar. Do you, do you remember mm -hmm. that one? Yeah, where it's like, I can't, it's somewhere in here. It's like, the, it's like the liar, it's like, it's like <laughs> the trope is the liar colon, I have no time to lie today, to lie today, <laughs> lies anyway. <laughs> like that's, like that's the trope. <laughs> and I was like, Oh God, that speaks to me so so intensely. So yeah, so I feel like I would just like find these like really weird ones too, where I'd be like, "What? All right, that's going in there," you know? <laughs> um, yeah. So it was just, and I feel like it just gave, and I was just really interested in the way that it gave, especially with like, the conception one. Like I was like, "Oh wow, there's literally an entire like subgenre of like ways to get pregnant without." Like in, uh, you know, in without in, not in the the expected way, um, and I actually took a bunch. That's actually not the whole list. Like I took a ton out because there was like it was like actually pages and pages <laughs> long. Um, but I yeah, and that was just like that's really cool and interesting and just like an interesting like kind of level of dimensionality and a way of sort of thinking about how the things. I, I also was very interested as I was writing in this sort of the the fundamental sort of agony of. Like when you're writing a story about domestic violence, like essentially you're writing about a cliche mm -hmm. because like when you look at like narratives of domestic violence, they all follow like really, really similar arcs. And that's true regardless of like, I mean, so, and there always are like details that are like interesting and specific and unique depending on the people who are in it. But like ultimately you're telling a story that's gonna move in the same way unless it's like interrupted by something else. And that's really hard to say like, I'm trying to write a story about this thing that to me feels like the most distinct, distinctly terrible thing that has ever happened to me. Yeah. But I'm, do, I'm doing it and it's a story that is like echoed by like millions of other people. So how do you, and like, so at first I felt like very like, un, like disempowering. Like I was like, oh my God, like how am I ever gonna do this? Mm -hmm. And then I was like reading through that thinking like, wow, like also folk tales and you know, fairy tales and urban legends, like they're all drawing from these like fundamental tropes that have existed forever and like they still manage to be these like beautiful strange objects mm -hmm. so I it kind of like I don't know it also kind of gave me this way of thinking about that idea as well mm -hmm. yeah and perhaps like fairy tales are a way to like make articulate something that feels like it cannot be articulated like to take something from another realm yeah. and drag it yeah. you know into a, something that's tangible yeah. um and I felt like that impulse to speak to something that um could not be articulated, like was sort of driving the book, and you've like talked about that in in like interviews and stuff to some extent. That this was um, like almost like trying to make something uh, 
visible that kept sort of slipping away. Yeah. And I also wondered, perhaps like from my own, relevant to my own interest, but there's a sort of a whole arc section about um, these women who uh, have killed their abusers mm -hmm. and then face like justice and our, or face justice, fake, face our legal system and have to navigate that, mm -hmm. trying to use um, like the battered woman defense to mm -hmm. various effects. So, you know, you talk about like Annette Green and West mm -hmm. Palm Beach, mm -hmm. Deborah, uh, Deborah Reed of the Framingham Eight. Um, and I wondered kind of like, w what was that impulse like to look at after, like murder, to take it yeah. to the, the space of, of murder and, and court? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, because I think as I was researching, what I real, because I was looking for like historical narratives to write about, like queer domestic violence, and I was, I would run up against this sort of dual pronged problem, which is that like there's there's an ar archival gap that exists around queer folks, and there's also an archival gap that exists around domestic violence, and that we, we've, I mean, the idea of even, the idea that it was possible to beat your wife is only like 50 years old. Like, mm -hmm. that was like late 70s, when like we began to like talk about that as like a concept. Mm -hmm. um, and before that, it was just like not even like pathology. I mean, it, it should be pathologized, but it's like, it sh you know, it, it wasn't like even an idea that people understood. Um, and so, um, so I was, I was just looking, I would like look through like old diaries of like, old, and I just was like, I don't know how to like begin to even and I would like ask, I wrote to like Lillian Faderman, who's like the lesbian historian of all of human history, and I fucking love her. And I was like, Lillian Faderman, <laughs> this is a shot in the dark, but can you think of any <laughs> like, like historical, you know, abusive lesbian relationships? And she wrote back and she was very sweet. And she was like, I can't, but I don't, it's not that I don't think they exist. It's just that like, I, I, so it was just like this weird thing where I was trying to figure out. And then I was like, well, how do I, how do I know? Mm. And then I was like, what? And then I sort of at some point stumbled across like, this entire line of research that I did not know I'd be really interested in, which is this idea of um, lesbians killing their lovers mm -hmm. in the way that like battered, like battered straight women, as which is like a weird term, but like mm -hmm. like straight women would kill their would kill their abusive husbands, um, and the ways in which lesbians sort of bounced uh, off that system throughout history. So, for example. Um, so Deborah Reed was part of the Framingham Eight, which was this group of women who were in Framingham uh, prison in Massachusetts, and they had all killed their abusive lovers. And Deborah was the only lesbian in the group, and um, she was she was black. She was a lesbian, and like throughout this process, you, we I, what I would discover was like uh, a race played a huge huge part in like the way that these cases were um, sort of would, would sort of um, be decided, um, and also like there was a lot of like judges. So like the judges for Deborah were sort of like trying, or the, the lawyers for Deborah were like, she's the woman, like she right. cooked, she cleaned. Like, cause they, cause basically the narrative that we had about domestic violence was like, you know, the abuser is like the, a big hulking husband and the wife is like a small, it's like a small white woman and he punches her and gives her a black eye and like that's the narrative. Mm -hmm. And so if you were like, if you fell outside of that in any capacity, people were like, I'm so confused. Like, I don't know what mm -hmm. to do about this. And so yeah, and so like Annette Green, so like Deborah, like she yeah. kind of went, there was like this commission that was uh, re, um, convened to see if like these women should have their sentences overturned and like Deborah's was not. And like they were, the lawyers were sort of like, or the, the committee was like, well, we think that they engage in a mutual battering relationship, even though there was no, that was not even part of this process. But mm -hmm. like, that's like a common like misconception about like lesbian abuse. And then like Annette Green was like, had the shit beat out of her by her girlfriend. She killed her girlfriend. She tried to use the battered wife the battered woman syndrome defense. Mm -hmm. The judge was like, no, I, only if we call it battered person defense. Yeah. Like it was like they couldn't yeah. find a way. I don't know, it was just like, and then she ended up losing anyway. They were just like, no, like you don't, you, you murdered your. Anyway, so like it was totally. just really, it was like this really weird sort of process of research where like, I just like follow this rabbit hole and like legal papers are really interesting <laughs> and they have tons of footnotes to take you to other places. Yeah. It's like you can lose days in like legal papers, which is exactly what I did. So yeah. yeah so I just feel like it just kept like or unfurling the stuff for me about like gender and like how we think about like how women are capable or not capable of committing violence and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like it was just, I don't know. It was just like really, really, it was super interesting. Mm -hmm. so. I mean, I was just like, what and I was yeah. just like texting you and texting all my friends <laughs> yeah. like but how could this be yeah and I think I think what really like blew my socks off in that moment was just that the way that you show that um because being a queer woman who has sex with and is in a committed like life in a sexual way with another woman is so illegible in our world yeah. then domestic abuse is like between queer people sort of broadly mm -hmm. women trans uh non-binary identified is like 
it's already illegible and then it's like they don't understand. There's no way to put that into the context yeah. of what you're saying. So if queerness is legible yeah. itself, then queer domestic abuse is like doubly illegible. Right. And it's like weird because I feel like I kept just discovering these like weird parallels between like the way we talk about queer domestic violence and the way we talk about queer sex. So like there was this like famous, so these, I mentioned this case of these like Scottish schoolmistresses who were like caught having sex in like, I don't know, the 1880s or something. And the judge, the, literally the ruling was there's no, I mean, it was, this is not it, but it is summary. It was, there's no penis, so there's no orgasm, so there was no sex, so they're fine. <laughs> and like, that was literally the thing that they, I mean, they, you know, it was a man named Lord Meadowbank, which I remember <laughs> for some reason. It's, that was his like quote, you know, he had this very long quote that basically was like, the, the venereal orgasm cannot possibly follow, like basically. Oh and, um, which is like, A, ouch, and also no. Um, <laughs> but like, but uh, but yeah, and so the idea that like it's not even possible that like it, I can't conceive it's like a, like an unthinkable idea for women to have sex with each other, and so in the same way it's like also unthinkable to imagine like them. It's a, yeah, so just the sense of like yeah, this eligibility or like this sense of just like we don't as a straight society like we don't understand like what we're even looking at. Yeah. So therefore, it does must not exist. Mm -hmm. Um. Which ended up like I said like I didn't go in knowing that was gonna be like part of the book, but that was like what my what the research sort of unfurled for me. Totally, so, yeah. and I think that those, those are some of the most powerful and um, insightful sections, I think, uh, mm -hmm. for me at least. I was wondering if you would humor me and read one more. Sure. Which is um, Dream House as Betrayal, what page? 142. I think that you all need to hear it because I think it's really important. Dream House as double. Is it double cross? Cross. Yeah. Not betrayal. So sorry. That's okay. I was like, that's there's a synonym. So Dream House as double cross. This maybe was the worst part. The whole world was out to kill you both. Your bodies have always been abject. You were dropped from the boat of the world, climbed onto a piece of driftwood together, and after a perfunctory period of pleasure and safety, she tried to drown you. And so you aren't just mad or heartbroken you grieve from the betrayal. Mm. Thank you. Okay, I knew betrayal was in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that this is really important because there, this is another like core sort of snake-like theme that runs through this book is this idea of um, queerness, especially within like, again, like the community of non-cis men as the sort of like utopia or paradise mm -hmm. that like um, once we like get rid of men, like all is chill mm -hmm. and so, which is an interest, which is a persuasive idea, as you talk about. So I was <laughs> <laughs> sounds nice. Um, it's tempting, certainly. I'm here for it. <laughs> but I was kind of wondering, like, where do you think this promise of like all is going to be well comes from, and like, how yeah. did that that notion of um, sort of disrupting that fantasy, like like domestic abuse, like cracks that fantasy? Yeah. How did that come to you? Well, I was thinking a lot about, I mean, I think I just sort of kept returning to this idea that like, why was it so difficult? Like, why is it so difficult to articulate, even writing this book, knowing what I know? Like, why was it so difficult to articulate on the page? Like, what, that feeling of betrayal? And what does that, what did it mean? And I became very interested in this idea that like, yeah, so what I say in the book is basically that like, yes, like, I understand why, like, in my day-to-day, -day, like, I'm married to a woman, in my day-to-day -day life, like, there's a lot of, I mean, I've also dated men, and like when I was dating men, there was a lot of like day-to-day -day, like negotiation of masculinity that's just, like exhausting, and this like constant sap on your energy that just like <laughs> was the reality of being in a relationship with a man. And I don't have that right now because like I am married to a lovely woman, and like I don't have that problem. And so I can see how that's like an interest. Like you're like ah, if like you don't have that accompanying bullshit draining you and dragging you down every single day, that's pretty nice, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. it is, it is. Um, but that also doesn't mean that like you're free, mm -hmm. and it also doesn't mean that like. And so I think we have this idea where it's like, well, you know. And also I think this idea that like if you're a person who's like in the closet or you like don't know that you're queer, and then you have sex with a woman for the first time, or you know, and you're like, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. This is all I've ever wanted. As it turns out, sex is great. You know. <laughs> um, then suddenly, it, I mean, I can understand how that feeling of just like this is everything I've always wanted. This is like what. I didn't know I could have like that that's very intoxicating and that totally makes sense to me but then I think then sort of the other side of that coin is like that there's this like, inability to sort of recognize that like women can also hurt people you know and like 
that, um, and like as I was reading, I just kept noticing all this language about utopia. Like there would just be all these languages about like punctured dreams and shattered utopias, and like always around this conversation of like of like queer, like sexual assault and domestic violence, like within queer communities. Mm -hmm. And I just was like, that can't be an accident. I mean, even and I say in the book, like even, I mean, the, the symbol of the queer community is a rainbow, which is mm -hmm. literally God being like, I know I just like destroyed the shit out of your planet, but I won't do it again, I promise, <laughs> right? Like that's literally what that is. And like, so I just feel like there's just like this weird energy. I mean, so yeah, so again, that was not a thing that I walked into the book, I walked in writing the book thinking about, but like as I was writing, I was like mm. returning these ideas over and over again. And, and I just was like, yeah, like I think that, that what maybe makes it so hard is like when you think of a thing as a utopia, and I think that's true of all things. Like if, you th if you think of a place as safe, you're wrong. And if you think of a situation as fundamentally good, you're wrong, mm. you know? And I, and I feel like I also think about this a lot with like institutions where I'm like, you know, the reason I've, I hesitate to ever be like, I am loyal to an ex institution is because like, it's made up of people and people are always really fucked up. Mm -hmm. And there's always gonna be this like fucked up element to it. And if you think of it as like incapable, as like a perfect thing that is incapable of corruption, ultimately you will be hurt or someone else will be hurt believing that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like I just, I mean, that just became like this thing that really, I don't know, spoke to me um, mm. when I was when I was working on the book. Mm -hmm. so. mm. Okay, this is a lovely one. It starts by saying, "Hi, you're incredible." Oh. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Is that the answer? Did I answer the question correctly? The answer is oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Also, Thank this you. person has very nice handwriting. <laughs> they say, "Do you feel you've had to justify the quote literary integrity of your work due to its speculative nature throughout your career slash education?" Sincerely, a hopeful mfa -er with a speculative streak. Oh, I feel you so hard. You know, no, I haven't. I mean, I have started writing professionally. So I started, you know, sort of beginning to direct my career professionally in 2010. And I feel like, I feel like the kind of genre snobbery that could really, like, make your career not happen was, like, is, like, over. Like, I feel like... I mean, yeah, I think individually, again, institutions can be fucked up, and like, I think individually, people have had some problems. But like, I've actually been really lucky in that, like, every step of the way. Like, I was at Iowa, which people think of as this like bastion of realism, but like, I only found like support for my really increasingly bizarre fiction there. <laughs> <laughs> like, the weirder I got, the more excited everybody was. Getting. You know, it was like so. I actually didn't feel that way, and I don't know. I think we're in this really amazing moment of just like incredible like horror and liminal fantasy, and like, there's just like, science fiction. There's like so much good work especially about like women and queer folks that's like happening right now. Um, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, so whoever, whoever asked that question, like, um, yeah, no, I think there's like a space for you and there's a space for like that kind of work, like kind of everywhere right now. It's like definitely, definitely beloved, I think, so. Yay. Who are your literary icons slash influences? Is there any influence from Borges? Oh, yes. I was about to say, I was, I'm having, so this, because I'm now touring the, the book, the, this book, I'm like, do I have to start answering that question with like nonfiction people? Because <laughs> now I'm like switching genres entirely. But my fiction sort of influences, yeah, like Borges, Shirley Jackson, Angela Carter, um, all, the, all the sort of sexy, weird ladies that you would expect, <laughs> um, and Borges. <laughs> Calvino, you know. That old guy, okay. Sure. <laughs> what made you want to write about SVU? Oh, God. Um, well, so there's a very, okay. So when I was living in California like 10 years ago, I had just, I was about to break up with my boyfriend. So we were not speaking and I was alone and I lived alone and my family did not live in California and I got swine flu. I don't know if any of you guys, <laughs> H1N1. <laughs> and it was right when Netflix had started that thing where it would just keep playing TV shows. Like it wouldn't, it wouldn't like stop and you have to click to the next one. It would just like keep going. And so I like was feeling kind of sick and I called out of work and I like was like, oh, SVU. I was like, you know, I've only ever watched that show like everyone watches it, which is like, you know, you catch a like half an episode in like four o'clock in the afternoon and then five hours later, you're like, why am I still watching the show? <laughs> um, but I had never seen it in order. And so I was like, I'll just start watching it. And so I like, you know, so I was like, ah, I don't feel, you know, so I like was sitting there in my robe and like started playing it. Three days later, <laughs> when I came out of what was surely a fever that almost killed me dead, like I should have been in the, I don't remember three days of my life. Like I probably should have been in the hospital. It was not good. Um, it was still playing. Like I had just, it was like many, it was like, a, it, so yeah, so I think I had just, so I just absorbed like 
God knows. So I feel like that story feels like kind of like a Lynchian, like SVU fever dream, <laughs> inappropriately speaking. And so, I, yeah, so I feel like that was like the emotional birth of that story. And then, yeah, at some point I was just like looking up episode descriptions to try to describe something to somebody. And I was like, oh, this actually would be an interesting like structure for a story. Mm. Um, and then I did it. <laughs> moral of the story. Um, delightful. How does the writing process of a memoir differ from fiction? It's, re it's really different. It's as different as I think I can imagine. Um, fiction I find very pleasurable and joyful and exciting and writing this memoir was like pulling out my own teeth. I mean it was like really awful. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, fiction for me is like playing. It's like I could just do it forever. And it's like just, even if I'm writing about stuff that's like really intense, like I just love that sort of act of creation. It feels really free form and really lovely. And memoir, you know, has that constraint and requires you to like interrogate stuff you don't want to look at. And it's just really difficult. And I honestly, people who like make careers out of it, I really admire them because I uh, honestly, like I finished this book and I was like, I'll never write nonfiction ever again. Like I'm super <laughs> done with that. Um, so yeah, it's just like a really different sort of just process. And I also just like, I don't know, I write, much, I write it much slower. Because when you write nonfiction, you're trying to figure out what you think, which I think is like a really fundamentally difficult, that's a really hard thing to know. Like truly like knowing what you think. And so, yeah, I just feel like it's always like a very, very laborious process. Even when it's not even super related to me, like it still just feels very like plotting and myth which is, you know, like why I would make like a terrible journalist. Cause I'm just like, it's just like, I can't move fast enough to like do any of the things, you know? Mm. Um, but yeah, so it's just, it's really different. Mm. Okay, this one has a quote from you, I believe. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> also very nice handwriting. Quote, I believe in a world where impossible things happen, where love can outstrip brutality, can neutralize it as though it never was, or transform it into something new and more beautiful, where love can outdo nature. Do you feel this way currently? If not, what has changed? I've never felt that way. That's a line from a short story of a character who is super fucked up. <laughs> and people, it's weird, people cite that quote a lot and I, it bothers me. It's weird because I'm, I'm actually pretty laissez-faire about like, you know, when you write a book, you're putting it out into the world. It's not really yours anymore. People read it, how they're gonna read it, and that's just like part of the process of being a writer. And you can't like dictate how people read your work. That being said, that people love that quote, but the quote is the quote is 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 being said in a first person story by a woman who is like deeply, deeply traumatized from an abusive relationship, and she's talking about it in the midst of like her relationship like fracturing to ten thousand pieces of a woman who physically and emotionally and psychologically abuses her. And so when she says like I believe love can outdo nature, like that's a lie, you know. When she says like you know, love can fix anything. It's like, no, love is hard work. Like, love is not this just, like, magical force that exists because, like, that's a thing that people say to other people when they're trying to make them do what they want them to do. Um, and so I know I've never felt that way. And I, it's interesting because, yeah, so it's a quote from, like, a short story that is not in my perspective. I mean, it mm -hmm. is actually... I wrote a whole memoir about it. It is a little <laughs> bit in my perspective. Um, yeah, I mean, that woman... I mean, that story was, like, my first attempt to, like, write a write fiction about this idea, like this thing that happened to me and this, and it's weird because in some ways like she's not like me at all, but in some ways it is this like weird sort of emotional like state. But like writing that story was so hard because I had to access like this version of me that was just like in the thick of it and like didn't know which way it was up. And that's who she's supposed to be is somebody who doesn't know which way is up. Mm. This question is about fatness and about, um, basically it says, uh, as someone who writes about fatness, to what extent did that play into this memoir, the body and your own feelings about fatness? Yeah, I mean, I talk about, I talk in the book about how, and again, this was not a thing that I sort of thought about when I first like went into the project, but you know, at some point I really had to grapple with the, the, the fact that part of the reason that I, like this book was really, there was like an element of embarrassment to this book because you know it's really embarrassing to like say to somebody like here is this, here's a series of like really bad choices that I made when I was 24 or whatever. 
And then having to sort of step back and be like, well, why was I making those choices? And realizing that part of the reason was that like, I truly believed that like, I did not have value. I did not deserve tenderness. I did not deserve somebody who treated me well. And if I left her, that nobody else would ever want me ever again. And it was just like a weird fluke that she loved me because I wasn't lovable. Um, and that, and it's weird because it's like, you know, I can trace, you know, I mean, I write a lot about fatness and like my family and my mother and like the way my family talk about bodies and like, it's really weird to think of like something as like something that's planted so early in like one's mm -hmm. life as then like affecting like a totally different set of circumstances where like, you know, at some point when I was a teen, my mom, you know, was trying to zip up a dress and it didn't fit me. And she was like, if you would just lose 10 pounds, like this would fit you. And I don't understand what the hell is wrong with you. And, um, and you can trace that to like me believing that like I couldn't leave this person because if I did, no one else would love me or touch me ever again. And like, that was a really, um, that was a really awful, like really awful part of the book. For some reason, the part of the book that triggers the most emotion for me, um, and I don't exactly know why, and I, I think it's just, I just think because it, it just, it felt, it's embarrassing, it's embarrassing to say that out loud, you know, and I think it's hard for people who aren't fat to understand that, you know, that like that, you internalize that so badly that even when you're sort of like, I'm great, everything's great, I'm, a, you know, like actually you're like truly in your heart of hearts believe that like it's a mistake that this person is with you um and the sense of desperation and like i can't lose them because if i do then like what else will i do mm -hmm. you know so so yeah so that just yeah so that actually is like is a part of the book it's not like i mean it's just like one of many sort of pieces of the book but mm -hmm. yeah hmm. i think this kind of ties into that this is about um apprehension and anxieties uh when writing, so did you have any apprehension when writing? For example, was it difficult to start writing um, because this book is about trauma, it's so difficult? Yeah, um, I mean, in some ways yes, in some ways no. So like I said, once I hit the form, a lot of it kind of came out of me very like actively. So like in that sense, no, like I, there was stuff that was ready to be born. Um, but yeah, there were parts of it that were really hard. I mean, I rewrote, I mean, the second draft of the book, the, the draft, so I sold Girl was a very skeletal thing, and then I spent last year adding 150 pages to it and then cutting out a lot of the pages that I wrote. Um, and yeah, that process was very difficult. Um, it, was very, it was very emotionally taxing. It was very stressful. Um, even just doing the research about, not about, so when it wasn't even about me, when it was like me researching like Deborah Reed and all these other people in these stories, like it was really devastating and it was just, it was hard. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I'm, I'm like, was I in? The, it was I don't know if I was actually in the right place to do it, but I like had to, and I didn't want to give the money back. So <laughs> I was like, well, guess guess I'm just doing this now. Um, <laughs> That's real. Hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it was just I don't know. It was hard. And then I think this is going to be our last question. Um, the question is why the dream house sub question. What do you dream about now? So the working title of this book was House in Indiana because the house was in Indiana. <laughs> and after I sold it, people kept asking me questions about the state of Indiana. <laughs> and, and they would come out to my vets and be like, are you from Indiana? I'm from Indiana. My cousin's from Indiana. I love Indiana. I hate Indiana. And I was just like, I have no thoughts about Indiana. Like, <laughs> I, I, I like truly, I, mean, I do have thoughts about it, but like not that are relevant to this. I don't want to like talk to people about the state of Indiana. Like that just, and I was like, I must change this title. I, I cannot abide. Too sweet, yes. It was just too stressful. So I, and it, so I was, that was like the work. And then I was like untitled for a long time. And then at some point, like while I was working on this, the final draft, um, my editor was like, oh, you know, you're, because you, the UK and Canada had also bought it and they wanted to announce the sale and they were like, you need to like pick a title because like they can't, they, you know. So I was like, cool, give me like three days. I'm just gonna <laughs> like buckle down and like figure the title out. Um, and so I spent three days just like writing down like as many house idioms as I could think of and like moving words around and just trying to get something that kind of like sparked or kicked. You know, I looked at ep epigraphs that I had cut that could have like a good phrase in it. I mean, I was just, I did everything I could think of. Um, and ultimately, in the Dream House was the title that came. Actually, initially, I had the title that I pitched to my editor was Dream House, and then my publisher, Fiona McRae, who, who publishes the publisher at Grey Wolf, was like, I once edited a book called Dream House. Can we add some other words into the title? And I was like, sure, how about in the Dream House? And she was like, great. And I was like, great. <laughs> Done. I mean, but I had to also, because it had to be a title that I could take like the piece of the title and put it in the titles of the chapters. Like I had like a, a thing I had to do, and so. 
I, um, so I did that. Um, so yeah, and it actually ended up, but it ended up actually being a really, like, like so many, it was like a weird accident that once I had picked it in this very like utilitarian manner, suddenly it began to actually resonate like in the book and like I would actually find references to it that I had sort of, it was like weird. It was like something I was like, oh, this actually is like a perfect title for it. And I also was finding a lot of language about like dreaming and dreams and utopias. And I mean, it just, it was just like, it actually tied in like really beautifully to a lot of the other stuff in the book. So it actually worked out really well. Um, and what do I dream about? I actually had a dream last night <laughs> that this aunt of mine who I don't like was yelling at me. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to. I don't know how to read that. Uh, I had actually read a piece about her. She's a piece about her in the book, and I had read it the d yesterday. So maybe that's what <laughs> that was all about. But um, yeah, what I, I, don't, I don't know. I have a lot of what kind of dreams do I have? I don't know. I don't have as many. I was a kid. I had a lot of nightmares. I was like, I had like sleeping. I had like a sleep. Like I had um. Oh, what do you call it? Um, sleep paralysis and exploding head syndrome and like all those like weird associated like sleep conditions that kids can get. Um, but I've now mostly grown out of them. Occasionally I have nightmares, but not nearly so many as I used to. Um, I don't know. Yeah. It's pretty wonderful and scary. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that that's our final question. And thank you so much again. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Free library. Yes.